One thing that's important to keep in mind with information in general is that the source of the information is kind of important, right? It, it matters where you get your information in terms of whether that information is likely to be accurate or not. And there are lots of really familiar examples of this. If you just think of, for example, like social media, um, anyone can post anything pretty much. It's not necessarily vetted for accuracy. Um, so it's important just to kind of keep that in mind, keep that in the back of your mind and, and know that not everything that you read is necessarily accurate or completely true. Um, and the same goes for scientific information, or, or at least information that appears to be scientific. Some sources are more reputable than others when it comes to reporting scientific information. So we just kind of want to lay this framework out. Um, we're going to make, make a list here of different sources of scientific information, and they vary in terms of not just the quality, but also the style. Each source is designed to reach a different audience, and depending on which audience it is, um, there may be more specifics given or, or less specifics given, and that's just kind of how it is. It's just important to be aware of that. So if we go to sort of the extreme end, the highest quality um, with the most details, this would be the type of scientific information that's included in journal articles. And journal articles, if you're not real familiar with them, journals include things like science and nature. Those are probably journals that you have heard of before. Those are published journals. And with journal articles, the big thing about them is that in order for something to be published in that journal, um, it has to pass sort of this review process. There are other people in the same scientific discipline that would read the article first and vet it for accuracy, just kind of to make sure that things check out and that there aren't a lot of questions behind this information. And then if it passes all of those checks, then it goes on and actually gets published in this journal. So this is the way, this is the primary way actually that scientists communicate with each other. This is how scientists um, convey information and scientists will go and look in journal articles in order to find information. Usually the language is very technical and it's really dry reading. It's not necessarily fun to read, but it's very precise, it's very accurate, and it conveys everything that you need to know in order to be able to replicate the experiment. So that's kind of one extreme, very high quality um, peer-reviewed journal articles. Okay, coming down the list here. Another source of scientific information would be things like science magazines or books that are nonfiction books, right? They're still pretty high quality, but it's not necessarily written for scientists. It's written for people who are interested in science, but maybe they don't necessarily work in that field. So this is meant for a well-educated public is what it says on the on the slide. There, this is from our textbook. Um, just meaning people who have an education, they're able to understand scientific things, um, but some of the technical language is omitted or translated into more common language instead for ease of understanding. Okay, so um, usually what these will do is is point you back to sources for more detailed information if you want to go and investigate further. So it might it might um, cite a journal article where you could go and, and read to find more in-depth information. Next we have things like news magazines, newspapers, and TV, television. Okay, so these are sort of general interest sources. These include information for a very wide audience, not specifically a scientific audience. Um, so the coverage tends to be less in depth. There's not quite as much detail included, um, but it, but they, they do a good job of conveying information that's of interest to the general public, right? Scientific information is sometimes just generally interesting, and this is a good way to get that sort of uh, that sort of information out to a wide audience. So a lot of times, one thing that gets interesting at this level, a lot of times these sources will consider how does the scientific information tie in with other fields. So like what are the social ramifications? What are some political considerations that might go along with it? So that gets really interesting to think about how, how the science is going to meet up with other facets of life too. 
Okay, finally, last on the list here is the internet, right? Definitely a source of information that pretty much all of us use. Um, but uh, the, the same principle applies depending on where you go on the internet. The information that you get will be higher quality, lower quality, somewhere in between. And um, just to give a few examples of this, if you go to an educational website, a website that's backed by some sort of educational institution. So this would be a website that ends with .edu. EDU stands for educational. Um, those tend to be pretty accurate. There are some exceptions because who is it that makes the website? It's individual people. Um, but a lot of times these are pretty well vetted. .com, if the website ends in .com, that means that it's a commercial website. So not necessarily quite as high quality because they might be out to sell something. Good to keep that in mind. .gov, uh, these are websites that are government agencies. .org, these are nonprofit organizations. So if it's a nonprofit, quality tends to be pretty good actually. If it's a .org, it tends to be pretty reputable information. Um, keeping in mind again that it's an individual who makes the website, so it's possible that there are errors or mistakes in there. Um, but anyway, one, one general comment about information on the internet, okay, it's really easy to make a website and put stuff on it. And the internet is not very, very tightly regulated. It's not really regulated much at all, um, at least compared to print media. So things like the, the journal articles we were talking about earlier or newspapers, those are a little bit more regulated. Um, so with the internet, it gets a little bit harder to tell what's really objective, what's just scientific information versus what's an opinion and versus what is an advertisement. Sometimes the lines between those start to get blurred a little bit more on the internet. So it's good if you're reading stuff from the internet, it's good to read with some skepticism. Probably we've all had some experience with this when it comes to health information, right? You have some symptom and you, you wonder about it. So you, what do you do? You look it up on the internet and it's really easy to get very worried about what you're reading. Um, you don't necessarily have the the context that's needed to sort of frame that information in the right place. So again, it's good to read with skepticism, right? Probably your doctor is gonna be a more reliable source of information for you when it comes to health information. So with that sort of problem in mind, just the, the problem, the fact that quality varies depending on sources of information, because of that, it's really good to learn um, how to be a, a critical reader and I use that phrase not in the sense of oh, I'm gonna be really critical of what I read but just rather it's good to be critical in the sense of sort of uh, doing mental checks and balances to see if this information actually actually seems to be valid so learning to be a critical thinker we're gonna list out six different ways six different things you can do in order to learn to be a critical thinker with regards to information that you're taking up from different sources